This is what I mean about getting off that beaten path, going a little bit further, diving with completely new people. Guys, we have an unbelievable episode for you guys today. 36 hours, we are running far to chase these giants. Stick with us, like this video, but first, I gotta drop off this cat. Gotta get my cat. Come with me, buddy. What's up, bro? What's up? That's just cargo. What's up, man? What's up, dude? Hey, nice to finally meet you. Yeah, man, it's been a minute. This is the sled. Oh, we got two engines, we'll be fine. Yeah. Got our first look at the boat here, and really solid boat. You know, when I go with people that I have never met and don't know at all, you really have no idea what, what you're gonna what to expect. Blake's boat looks rad. We got a Ton of extra fuel all over the place. This is gonna be an epic mission, but first I gotta get rid of this cat. Off to your new home. You guys excited? Yeah. Yeah? Big time. We're so stoked. Alright, honey girl. I see you later. Bye. <laughs> 36 hours we're gonna do on this boat. Go just a little bit further, get off that beaten path and hopefully find some giants. This year, I got a 30 pounder here. No way. Yeah, so. 30 pounder. Yeah, it, it was like 29 because um, a shark ate the belly out of it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm thinking it was 30 there with the go. belly. Man, 30 pound Uku would be the dream, guys. My biggest is right at that 20 pounds. So, uh, so that's, that's the fish we're looking for this whole trip. All right, so the guys already hit two spots and they didn't develop. If it's not happening, do not ever be afraid to move. You gotta keep moving until you find the fish, and then when you find them, you move real slow. Time to jump in and show these guys how it's done. This video is brought to you by Ryan and Sam's entire life savings. We sold out of merch last time in less than one week, so we invested it all back in another batch. This time, we kinda went nuts. We've got shirts, hats, sweaters, women's tanks, performance long sleeves, and performance hoodies. We hunted down the highest quality gear we could find and paired it all with that epic Shane Molina artwork. If we've ever taught you anything on this channel and you want to see it continue, go support the dream and pick up some merch before it's gone. So by the time me and Blake jumped in the water, we had already dropped the other set of divers like three or four different times on different spots and had zero fish in the boat. And anytime you're on one of these like really badass trips, there's so much pressure to produce. You know, you spend a lot of money on gas and ice and chum and a lot of time invested in this trip. and you, you really, there's a lot of pressure to make stuff happen and when you come out here and it starts off really slow, it's a little bit stressful, but it also makes you appreciate those fish even more. You know, if we were to come out here to this zone and these ukus were just coming up to 30 feet of water and just swam down and shot them, it would not have felt the same way as really truly putting the time and the effort into 36 hours of, of working hard, hunting these things, diving deep, and diving a bunch of different spots. Seriously slow start to our dive here. We have bounced spot to spot to spot, and we're seeing ukus. We spotted one Ono, but nothing seems to be interested. And we're ta talking to a couple of the other boats too, and that kind of seems to be what's going on. Now, I don't know if that's you know a time of day or a time of year or just the fish are weird right now or it's too flat or what. We're gonna keep pushing along, checking some stuff out. Regardless, the ocean is alive out here. Birds cruising all over the place, bait splashing on the surface, tons of life. I'm not sure if maybe our bad luck is just that I brought like a thousand dried bananas, but uh, we'll see. So what was really interesting about this day was that we kept seeing fish. I mean, there were ukus definitely coming into the chum line. And when we started diving the zone, like, you know, I asked the guys, I was like, how does this work? And it was very much like, just wait. Let those ukus get real competitive, let them fight with each other, let them come higher and higher and higher. Because once those, you know, eight to 10 pounders kind of clear out, that's when the 30 pounder comes in and starts, starts whacking that chum and they get real competitive and they come up a lot higher. So we were being really careful to not punch down too deep. You know, we're in the bottom about 150 feet of water. 
And honestly, guys, I was super, super out of shape this trip. I haven't been diving in weeks. I was kind of sniffly. It just, I wasn't feeling great. I wasn't feeling like that 150 foot bottom was even a possibility to get down there and hunt. So we were doing these shallower dives down 70, 80, 90 feet, looking around. And I could see the ukus down below us, but it just didn't occur to us to go down and try and get them, trying to get down to that 120, 150. And you know, we put a full day into working this zone and then got out of here and went to dive some other spots. But guys, the next day we came back here and we were not messing around. When we got here and they stayed deep, I immediately started punching some deeper dives. We picked up some fish in like 150 feet of water without a variable weight diving, which was just absolutely insane. So stick around for those clips because it's absolutely unbelievable. And guys, the 150 foot diving is not something that I do all the time, you know, but it is a definitely a nice tool to have in your arsenal when you need it like we did this trip. All right guys, so once again, the blue water-ish diving blows. So we're out of here racing over, seeing if we can't go find some really special reef zones. And we're gonna see if we can find an uku over there, go all the way to the bottom where hunt like I like to hunt. Can you take me to the fish now for real, yeah? Yeah, we'll go find them now. <laughs> So we moved zones and we got kind of back onto some of the territory that I'm definitely more comfortable on, which is like that 70 to 120 foot reef diving where, you know, even if we're dropping some chum and we got the flasher out, I know that when I see an uku or something I want in the chum line, I'm just gonna blow right past it, get down to the bottom and then hunt from down there and hopefully attract it over to me. So you can see that uku right there. I spot him on my way down. I knew he was there munching on a couple chunks, but I don't go over to him. You know, I don't want that midwater shot. That midwater shot for me is something that I definitely do not like. And in a 90 foot section, there's no reason not just to go to the bottom for me. I can get down there. I can get that left hand nice and placed. I can move forward with my hand if I need to. I can do my scratching, I can do my grunting. And I just have a much higher probability personally of landing that fish. Now you can see how insane the life is right here. Moves all over the place, just life. Mm -hmm. Opalakala is cruising around. And that uku coming in, kind of being curious, looking at me. And you'll notice how much more I get away with in this area than I normally could, you know, outside of Kona. You'll see multiple pools where like, I give myself a little pool there to get close, then I pause. Wait and see what he's doing. Another pool or two, get close, get that shot, stone that thing with that little Pathos 115. Very, very cool. I'm always stoked to stone one of these things. And this was the first fish we had in the boat, 36 hour trip, and this was like three o'clock. I mean, this mission started like five o'clock that morning. So we were pumped to get the skunk off the boat and get a quality fish. Go down, dude, there's a bunch of fish down there, bunch of huge pile of loot. So one of the really cool things that we had going on this day is we split up into pairs. So me and Blake were diving together and then Mitch and Drake were diving together. And that meant that there were two guys on the boat all the time and two guys in the water all the time. That definitely meant there was a lot of time spent on the boat. But that also meant that when you were in the water, you were awesome. You know, you had just two people. There wasn't a third to worry about. Everybody was, was really solid and that, that kind of worked awesome. So this is the Blake cam right here. And I told him, I was like, yo, there's a bunch of fish down there, get down there. And you can kind of see how he gets down to the bottom, does some really big dusting. Now it's definitely a little bit bigger than I would have thought, but check this out right here as he, as he spooks these fish and let us know why. So there were two things that kind of happened there. His alarm beeped, but also that pull forward. And there was a little debate on Instagram, but I think it was that pull and not the alarm going. You could see that it was definitely happened after the pool and not right after the alarm. But he managed to kind of still close that gap, get close enough. These fish have never seen people before and he managed to stick a really, really nice move. So this is the Blake cam again and this is a really, really cool example of kind of another hunting style that I don't necessarily do myself. You can see that uku come in and it's grabbing chunks and it's real kind of dumb and Blake goes down there with those squid fingers and it's kind of calling him in a little bit and takes this midwater shot and completely drills this fish. And Blake shoots a lot of fish in that midwater column. This is a style that he does. He's got that bigger kind of wooden gun and that works for him and it's awesome. And a lot of people do this. And it's just kind of a great example how different styles definitely land fish. Like I would have blown right past that fish, gone to the bottom, called him in. Probably had a very similar result, but this worked for him and it was pretty awesome. Well guys, took to like three o'clock to finally get that skunk off the boat. But sometimes that is the way it is. But once again, get me on the reef and the reef saves the day. One for me here, one for Blake, 
And another beautiful moo here for Blake. It's a nice moo, man. It's a good one. Couple fish on the boat. We still have a couple more hours sunset diving, diving all afternoon. Then we're gonna throw the hook and fish our whole way home. We, we've done what? 60, 70 miles today? What, what's our trip that now? We're at right, at right about 60. 60 miles already. We're gonna keep on running all afternoon. Tomorrow we got a long way home and we're gonna fish our whole way. So stick with this guys, this is gonna be, this is gonna be sick. It's not, the boat isn't sunk in fish yet, but that's still the plan. We're looking for those trophies, those real big ones. We'll see what happens. So on these really special trips, it's important to be even more selective with your shots and with the fish that you choose to take and, and go home with. You know, especially when you're in someone else's backyard, that is the time to be even more conservative and more selective with what, what you choose to take home. And I wanna show you guys this shot because I do not land this fish. And this was the only fish in two days that I shot at that I didn't land. And I tore him off and look right there at that one stupid piece of coral popping up right there in front of me. That one tiny head with those fish hanging on it is what ruined this for me. So no matter where I am, anywhere in Hawaii or anywhere in the world, it's kind of the same thing. I'm down here on the bottom, I'm looking around, I'm being as calm as I possibly can. I can pick out my target fish and then I'm doing a little grunting and a little scratching and I'm waiting to kind of call those fish over to me. I'm trying to be as natural down there as I possibly can. I'm trying to look like a non-threatening potential food source that those ukus want to come over and check out. And you'll see kind of what happens here is he does. He commits, he comes in. I do a couple pulls to get myself just within range there. And I take a little bit of a longer shot and I hit him definitely just a teeny tiny bit low. But I would have definitely landed this fish if he hadn't found this one little piece of coral right here. And you can see him cruising off to the right and then stop and then do like a full wrap around this tiny little piece of coral head on this flat bottom. And he actually broke my line right here. He broke my line. I lost this fish and I also lost this shaft. So one of my favorite times to dive is like right at sunset when you still have enough light to kind of see around, but the fish tend to get a lot more curious. I don't know if they're out feeding more at that time or they're just a little bit more active or whatever it is, but the sun was pretty low and we had some chunks drifting down and Blake was like, yo, look at that one, look at that one. And he pointed out a true monster. You know, that fish that we came here looking for, that big giant uku. And what's really cool about when you're diving with a proper pair and you guys are really in sync and buddied up, is there's no question of whose dive this is. You know, he just dove, so now it's my turn. And that's just the way it works. I can spend as much time as I want on the surface breathing up. We're not rushing each other, we're not chasing each other down to the bottom. There's just, there's no reason to because we both know that it's, it's my turn to dive and I'd be the same way if it was for him. And that really allows you to take your time and do those longer dives when they really matter, which is exactly this situation. You know, I knew that I wanted to have enough time to sit down there and fully work this fish until I could get a shot that I wanted. Uh, uh, uh. You can see those nice grunts down there on the bottom, trying to lay as low as I can and that big giant uku just swimming so slowly, cruising out on the edge, back and forth, a couple more grunts here. Uh, uh trying to do as little as possible. You know, it's not about doing a lot down there. It's not about throwing a lot of sand or doing a lot of grunting. It's about being super non-threatening and super, you know, making him curious, making him just curious while you are not scaring him away. And then when he gets as close as you think he's gonna get, it's about pouncing, getting that little bit of distance and, and sticking your gun out there and making that shot and, and, and getting what you can here. You can see this right here, a nice little lunge forward, the explosion out, but slowly enough to not scare him away. And I hit this fish honestly really, really low. That was not a good shot at all. And I was kind of stunned that I kept him on. I mean, this thing is ripping line right now and I'm letting him. I wanna play this thing softly. I wanna play him as carefully as possible to, to make this happen and land this absolutely trophy fish. And when you've got a really good buddy, it's not, there's no communication needed. He knows that I'm playing this thing really soft. He can tell that this fish might need a second shot and that's his only mission right now. He's not looking for Onos, he's not looking for another Uku in the chum line. He's cruising with me, going to, to make sure that we as a team land this fish. I like hardly pulled this thing off the bottom. I was keeping it so careful, so light, 
and Blake made it all the way down here and did kind of something that I see all the time with second shots where he just got too close to it. And you get too close and that fish is moving around and you, you kind of struggle because you're real careful about, you know, you want to hit in the head, but if you just came around the corner a little bit further away from it and approached it, you could have a more natural shot. But he did manage to stick this thing for me, got it right there in the gill plate, and we secured by far my biggest Dooku ever and we were unbelievably pumped. This is the fish we came for. This was it right here. There was really just no way I could possibly think about how to top this fish. So I got out of the water, let the guys dive the rest of the sunset. And guys, I cannot believe that the next day I got something even cooler. So stick around and wait for that clip. What do we he's think? Throwing. What do we think? He's, he's going. He's going over. 20, 26, 6. Yeah, 25. 25? Okay, guys. Zero now. All right, guys. I just landed the biggest uku I've ever seen. I don't know. We're thinking 20, 25. The official weight going up. Yes! Yes! He's got 25! Yes! 25, 3. 25, 23? What is it? 20, between 23 and 25. Yeah? Uh, 25. Go 25. We'll call it 24. <laughs> I think we gotta go 24. What do you think? Between yeah. 23 and 25. Heck yeah! 24, too. That is it! Yeah. That is the fish we came for right here. Go a little bit further. Get off that beaten path, find new zones, dive with new people, and made it happen. And guys, we are only halfway done. I gotta say, I slept a lot better than I was expecting. Now we're back out here again for day two. Drop some chum, put that flasher back down. Boys just got one. Let's see her. What you got? You! I was just going down to chum and he swam right in. Sick! You didn't even chum? I didn't even, well I, I dropped like a couple little pieces and he, he was like breakfast. It's gonna be a different day today, I can feel it. We're gonna find him. So we were feeling a lot better today. You know, we got out there, the other guys dove first, they already put a couple fish on the boat, and you know, the skunk was off the boat, we had fish, no worries, everything from here on was gravy. And while we were floating today, it was those long blue water drifts of floating and chumming and floating and chumming, and I'm sitting there bored and I'm like, well, let's go a little deeper and let's kind of see what happens. And this is a 122 foot dive, the first dive of my day. This is the first time I ever went below the surface all day long. And and just kind of cruised on down with no real intention of going to the bottom, but knowing that I was just gonna push a little bit further and just kind of see what was down there. And as I get down here below, kind of like where you could really see the visibility line, you could, I started to see some fish. There was a couple of ukus around down there, staying deep and eating the chunks. And what Blake is always telling me about like shooting these midwater fish is you really gotta kind of engage them in the midwater. So like you see me kind of move off and then kind of come back and he comes in and then just sticks him right there through the head, real calm and made this thing happen. And this, like I stated earlier, not at all my favorite way to shoot fish. You know, I was actually really nervous about this trip because I knew that this was how it's done over here. You know, you're waiting for these fish to come up off the bottom and you're diving now, you're shooting them midwater. So I wanted to get really, really close and I did and I managed to stick this thing and was stoked. But now we kind of figured something out. We were like, wow, these fish are just hanging down deeper. They're just deeper and that's where we've got to go to get to them. So I landed this one and then Blake goes down right after me and gets one even deeper. First dive of the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So Blake did a lot of free dive training as well. And one of the things that we've learned there is that the flasher acts as kind of like a free dive line. So it helps us kind of go parallel straight down to the bottom and not kind of veer off to the left or right. And we use that line as kind of a guide. So it was kind of cool to see Blake do that exact same thing that I do. And you'll see as he's cruising down, it's all very, very similar. You know, at this level of diver, it's we're all doing pretty much the same thing and it and it's because it works and Blake bust out a 125 here and throughout this day we just kind of kept one up in each other a little bit deeper a little bit deeper and picking off fish so you can see him kind of level off here he's got those couple fish out there cruising around this is the same spot that I just pulled one off and you can see those squid fingers he's moving his hands just kind of like you know looking 
creating some kind of distraction, something to entice that fish in. Again, not something I like to do, but you see this all the time all over the world. A lot of people like this. He's got that bigger three-banded gun. He's able to kind of get in there, close that distance a little bit, put the second hand on the gun, take a little bit longer shot, and just crush another Uku from 125 feet. Pretty much any time either of us shoot a fish and it's even questionable, the other diver will go down and look at it. Now we don't always put a second shot, but we definitely go down and check it out. And you just, it's worth it every time to not risk losing a fish at the surface. I mean, these are beautiful animals. The last thing we want to do is lose it because we were too lazy to reload our gun. So I go down there and stick this thing again, make sure it's secured and we land a freaking beautiful fish from 125 feet down. How deep was that gun? <laughs> nice. There's two more down there, but we were it up. We just had to go to the bottom. Yeah, we just the gotta whole go time. deep. So unlike the last dive, this one I knew I was gonna go try and go deep and try and get down there to the bottom and see what's up. But first, I want you guys to pay attention to my breathe up here. One purge breath right here. Another purge breath right here. One more purge breath right there. All of those breaths are designed to blow off some of that extra CO2. And then these long exhales are designed to lower that heart rate back down and kind of build up a little bit more of that CO2 to make sure that you don't have too low of CO2 and you end up blacking out too early. Then right here, one more nice long exhale just to be safe and make sure that I haven't blown off too much of that CO2 and my heart rate is nice and low. And then one last peak inhalation, and then my dive. And then key to all spearfishing, but especially when you're diving super deep, is a really nice water entry. And the way I do mine is I pretend like there's no gun in my hand at all, and it's just like I'm doing a regular water entry with the open hand, except my gun pulls back, comes back to my waist, and then lays right against my shoulder as I cruise on down. I use that flasher, and I kind of line up with it just as if it's a line that I'm diving out there, free dive training on the line. And I that keeps me, again, going nice, vertical, straight down to the bottom, no kind of angles, so I'm not doing any extra work. Then once I'm in that 60, 70, 80 foot range, I'll kind of go into my sink phase and I won't do any more kicking and I'll just allow my negative buoyancy to really pull me down to the bottom, hopefully by my head with that neck weight on. And then as I get closer to the bottom, I start doing these spins and these spins are really easy with just a twist of the ankle so that I'm not using any energy, but I'm kind of deciding which way I want to point, which way I want to look, where the fish are at. Then when I get to the bottom and I kind of set up, I there's kind of a couple noises going on here. That's because I was really struggling to equalize. I didn't do any um, reverse packs down there. I didn't make a mouth fill. So I didn't have a whole lot of air in my cheeks to, to equalize and put into my station tubes. So I really didn't feel comfy down here. And so I touch and go and I kind of looked around, I saw a couple fish and then I was out of there heading to the surface. And then as I get closer to the surface, I'll start floating up. And then right there on the surface, I'll do my hook breaths to make sure that if I was close to a blackout, one doesn't occur. Down there, yeah, but super just didn't violently stay for a second. Then come in, yeah, go 150. So now I knew that there were definitely a few fish down deep, but I also knew that I felt pretty uncomfortable down there and I was gonna have to add something to my breathe up to make me a little bit more comfortable and make those equalizations easier. Now, you can really pay attention to my breathe up here on the surface. I'm gonna break down everything for you guys. So right now, I've got full 20 second slow diaphragm exhalations. There's 20 seconds in between these breaths. Check this out. This is me pursing my lips and slowly exhaling that, that air from my lungs to lower my heart rate. This is absolutely the best way that you can bring that heart rate down prior to a dive. And then I'm gonna switch it up and do a couple of these purge breaths to blow off some of that extra CO2. There's one right here, that's a chest breath. Another one right there.
and then another one right there. And then I'm gonna do one more really long, slow diaphragm exhalation. And those diaphragm exhalations are so, so important to make sure that your heart rate is low enough that you, you have enough CO2 in your body to not black out. Then I got my peak inhalation here and then check this out. So if you've never seen that before, what that was, was that was me actually packing. And what that means is that I did a full peak inhalation of as much air as I could possibly hold in my lungs. And then I flipped on my back and spit my snorkel out. And I did a really, I did like 12 or 15 small packs there. And that's actually using my tongue as a piston to pack more air down into my lungs. And what that does is that makes it a little bit easier for me to equalize down deep. It keeps me from kind of needing to do a mouthfill technique or any kind of reverse packing at depth. It gives me more volume to my lungs and makes me feel better while I'm down deep. And it keeps me, you know, keeps some of that pressure off of me a little bit. And then I'll do that really long, slow descent where I'm, I'm getting down into sink phase now, I'm probably sinking, and then I'm gonna do my spinning. And guys, all these techniques are, are super advanced and I, I, I really struggled with whether I was gonna share them with you guys or show you guys my breathe up exactly. But if you guys don't know what purge breaths are and you don't know what hook breaths are and you don't know what diaphragm breaths are, don't do them. Don't try and copy what we're doing out here. This is super, you know, professional level stuff. So when I get down here to the bottom, like always, level out just before the sand, hit the sand and look around and super pleasantly surprised to see all the ukus kind of coming in. You know, there's two right there that honestly I would have been a lot, very happy with, but I was, then I looked to my left and there was another two and I was like, damn, that those are the ones that I want over there. But you can kind of see how much more comfortable I look on this dive than I did on the one before. And that's from adding that little bit of volume to my lungs. So I get my lunge there, just like it doesn't matter, just like I'm hunting in 70 feet, cruise on up there, manage to stick this fish, I am pumped. And there's one thing about diving super, super deep is any kind of problem gets so exacerbated so quickly. So like, you know, if my reel were to tangle up down there or my belt reel had a problem or I had a tangle in my, in my shooting line, it's, it, everything happens so fast and you've gotta kinda have it all planned out like what you're gonna do. And for me, that's dropping the gun every single time. If there, anything happens, the gun's getting dropped. If anything happens with my fins or my body, the weight belt's getting dropped. And I've practiced that, I've done it a bunch of times. It's it's very standard and it's second nature. And then as we're diving like really good buddies like this, Blake comes down there, he meets me, he's ready. And then that right there is really cool. It's one of the things that I do when I'm fighting a fish. I do my hook breaths through my snorkel. I come up and that right hand is ready to grab that snorkel, slam it back in my mouth, and then I'm immediately ready. I'm back in the fight for these fish. You know, if I don't do that and I come up and I do my, my three hook breaths on the surface and then my three cleansing breaths, you know, I'm not in the fight. That's 30 seconds that I missed out on controlling this fish. So I come up and I do that right through my snorkel and then the fight is on. So I play this thing super, super light, bringing him up from 150 feet. Lucky to have plenty of capacity on that Pathos reel that I'm using with that little Pathos Roller 110. And guys, again, if, you, if you're looking for any spearfishing gear for Christmas, use my code, I'll put it up on the screen, RMX10 over at American Dive Co. And I've got the links to all the stuff that I'm using personally down below. And again, if you guys wanna help us support the dream and appreciate what we do over here at RMX Spearfishing, you guys are entertained or taught at all, consider going over there, picking up some merch on our website. We got all kinds of cool stuff that just dropped. It would really mean the world to us. Thank you guys so, so much for watching, but don't go anywhere because we're about to feed 55 Chick-fil-A sandwiches to total strangers that I just met over Instagram. <laughs> That's pretty sick, dude. Is that for the sand? 150. <laughs> Good shit, bro. Yeah. Bro. <laughs> Not my biggest, but I'm freaking pumped on this one. On the depth. <laughs> Just barely, huh? It was close. Yeah. Pro I mean, he's small enough that he probably didn't need another shot. No, but... it's good though, it's good. You don't wanna, there's oh, nothing worse than like having the opportunity to second shoot a fish. Yeah. And not taking it because you're lazy and then. And then it rips out. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's my, uh, my deepest non-variable fish for sure. No shit. Deepest one I landed. I take shots deeper, but I never landed one deeper. That's pretty sick. All right, guys, we finally found him. We just had to go another, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 feet down. That was you, 124. Yep. 124, 120, or 121, I don't remember. Like 120 something. And then 150. Guys, check that thing out. Deepest, deepest constant weight fish ever, right there. 
150 feet to the sand. That was freaking sick. That was sick. Yeah, dude. <laughs> one thing is for sure, wow. I am out of shape because that 150 was not easy. I do not remember like 150 for 217. I tagged sand and I was like, I gotta go. I, <laughs> I saw him coming in, I was like, oh, we gotta do another dive here. Ah, that was freaking awesome. That's what it's all about right there, guys. Ran a little further, trying some new stuff, and landing epic fish. All right, guys, made it home there. Long journey home, long trip. How far did we run, any idea? 130, 100, 130, 140 miles, but paid off. Check out this freaking monster. That thing is an absolute dinosaur. That is about as big as they get. We gotta clean all these things up. I got like two hours to make my seven o'clock flight back to Kona. So I'm gonna clean these things real quick and then we're gonna see you guys back over there and I don't know what Sam's got planned for him. Hopefully, Uku Chick-fil-A sandwiches. Now, if you've been watching this channel, you know that we basically invented the Chick-fil-A copycat fish sandwich. There have been imitators out there, and me and Sam may battle over who actually had the idea, but it definitely came from this household. So, we wanted to make it for as many people as possible and share it with you guys. So we posted this to Instagram and waited to see who would show up. And if you guys aren't following me over on Instagram, I would go do that because we had so much fun that we're definitely gonna do this again. The secret to the Uku Chick-fil-A sandwich is in the pickle juice. The pickle juice acts as like a marinade, breaks down some of the fish, gives it like that vinegary, pickly flavor. I don't know, but that's the Chick-fil-A secret. So this is that slab from that 24 pounder. I'm gonna try and make this thing go as far as I possibly can because I have no idea who's coming or how many people are coming. That's a fish sandwich. Nothing wrong with that. So I got enough for 55 mini Chick-fil-A sliders. They still got scraps for the kitties. These guys are gonna marinate for like the next hour. We're gonna gather the rest of the stuff and we'll see you guys over at Pines. Okay guys, we're here. We have beautiful outdoor kitchen set up. I have 55 Chick-fil-A chicken sandwiches. Ooh, no idea if anybody's gonna show up. Like they've been sitting in here for like an hour and they've almost kind of like cooked in that vinegar. Fish sandwich you ever had or your money back? <laughs> I feel. The going. Best fish sandwich you ever had? It is Chick fil A. It's so good. I just feel like you went to the mainland and brought back Chick fil A. I did. And just oh, super, it up. super good. It's impressive. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Ryan, what'd you just do? Went in and got a fish. Oh my god. Like a minute and a half. Good. Best fish sandwich we ever had? Way better than the best I've ever had. What do we think? Awesome. <laughs> so good. Yeah. To win. Yeah? Heck yeah. So yeah. good. Or Sammy's. <laughs> good shooting, Brian and Blake. Delicious. Guys, we did it. 55 Chick-fil-A sandwiches served to all of our new friends and old friends. Guys, this is what it's all about right here. Epic way to end an unbelievable trip. We just launched that entire new line of merch. We got shirts, we got sweaters, we got tank tops. Go down there. If I've ever taught you anything, check that out. And we'll see you next time right here on Ryan Myers Expeditions. <laughs>